But what we now know from more, you know, from more recent science is that when you get certain types of chronic infection, the bacteria actually get into the wall of the bladder. They're actually inside the cells. And they've done that. They originally did this in animal models. They did it in, in mice. And then they've shown the same thing in humans. And you can model and you can actually, you know, you can use fluorescent bacteria that tagged and even see them inside. The, in, 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 inside. So, so we now know this as, a, as, a, as this is something that happens. But here's the thing. Once they're in the once they're in the bladder wall you can't you can't detect them where where do you where do you where do you look for bacteria you look for in the urine here and yeah but if they're inside the wall of the bladder they're essentially hidden to your urine culture and so, so that in itself then starts so almost an, a, a part of that condition is that it becomes difficult to detect there are other factors that probably throw in as well that, yeah, generally if you've got a urine tract, you tend to drink a lot more and that may be diluting out whatever bacteria is in the urine is probably being diluted out. And, and there are probably other factors that confound this. But this is a big thing. This, this idea that you've got these what you call intracellular bacterial colonies, IBCs. Oh. Uh, we've now known about this for, um, for about 20 years now since the original animal work and, and stuff was, was, was done. But that change, you know, that changes the way we look at this in a, you know, normally we taught is, oh, someone's got, um, got, you know, got cystitis, has symptoms, get a urine culture, shows bacteria. Hopefully in that bacteria, also you get some sensitivity on it and you treat it with antibiotics. Here you've got, yes, you've got bacteria, but they're hidden. They're actually within the bladder itself. And that mechanism of its social bacteria, that is part of its evasion mechanism. It's trying to evade a detection both by the immune system. It's, it's how it persists. And as those shells then get shed from the, the lining of the bladder, they then back into the urine. This is part of why you get this sort of up and down sort of flaring of symptoms. But it creates, from a diagnostic point of view, it creates a problem. But in answer to your, back to your, your original question, which was in relation to chronic uh, UTI, how do we think about that? I think these are some of the features that we know are part of it. This idea that the you know, symptoms don't seem to completely go away, often difficult to detect. And then, and then a third one might be that is, you know, the way it responds to antibiotics. Often they require, you know, either sometimes you, you see more limited response or it requires a much more, a much longer course of antibiotics to get that response. You know, and, and one of the theories for that is that you know, it takes time. Yeah, I, I, the, the antibiotics have to be then as those bacteria in the cells that they're embedded, as those come to the surface, you begin to, that's when the, the antibiotics can get it. Because while they're inside the cell, the antibiotics can't get at them. Yeah, just so, just, one of the you, yeah, yeah, so, just, sorry, sorry to cut you off there. Because it's quite an interesting point where, because I think it's quite important for people to understand is that obviously with the symptoms of urine infection, the, the bacteria normally generally tends to be in the urine itself. But what happens, we now know, is that the bacteria embed into the wall of the, of the bladder and while that's whilst that's happening that the patient can be potentially symptom free or very low level symptoms is that correct and then obviously the bladder lining has to shed as part of yeah, everyone's bladder lining sheds and the bacteria fall off, off the bladder lining into the urine and that gives you the, the symptoms but of course you know the rest of the time where it's embedded that, that can go missed right um exactly exactly yeah. uh and i mean, and when you think about it from the bacteria's point of view it's a pretty clever way of hiding yourself and coming out and you're, you're essentially You've almost like hijacked the body's own defenses. So one of the defense mechanisms that the body uses is to shed the cells. That's why when you've got a urinary tract infection, what happens to the urine? It becomes cloudy. And it's not just cloudy because there's bacteria in there. It's cloudy because your own cells are being shed. And that's where the way your body's trying to get rid of those bacteria. But what this it's doing is that while it's embedded, it's almost like it's hidden. It's hidden to our diagnostic cells. It's hidden to, to a certain degree to, to our immune system as well. And then as it comes out, then you start to get the flare up and then your body starts to attack. And this, this cycle can persist. Um, one way that is hypothesized to break that cycle, and, 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 and we do see that, is that you know, if, you've got, if you've got you know, a longer course of antibiotics that seems to stay there, then as those bacteria, as they come out, they get, they get then dealt with. And, and eventually you get to a point where you know, you've got new line in your bladder that has come up. That hasn't got hasn't got any bacteria within it. This is very different to classically why the way we thought of um, urotractor, where basically the infection is an ascending infection. It's coming from sort of tissue, you know, essentially coming from bowel, basically, and the the bacteria migrating up the the tissues near the genitor 
so and, it, and, and, and maybe it colonizes the area around the vagina in women or around the perineum in, uh, in in men, and then it migrates up the urethra, the water pipe, and up, up into the up into the bladder. And that's probably how most UTIs do start. But this is like almost like a, an adjunct that once it's in, it then finds a way to um, you know to get into the cells and 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 hide within there. And the other interesting part of this hypothesis is that there is also a theory that this is somewhat driven by antibiotics and that and that if you give somebody a short course of antibiotics, what it tends to do is it pushes the bacteria to try and want to do that because that's how they're going to that's how they're going to escape. Um, and so. And, and the reason this is, again, this is all a theory. This is not, you know, we, we don't know for 100 percent for sure, but reason is that reports of chronic uti and this sort of persistent type symptoms sit just you know do not and and and, and recurring uh, uh, utis don't seem to exist in the pre-antibiotic era uh um and so there is this theory that maybe antibiotics are actually pushing that it could just be that okay maybe people had this but they just didn't present to people they just just put up because they didn't know you know well, how's it going to get treated or whatever but there are reports of you know, UTI and cystitis, et cetera, going back, you know, centuries. It's not exactly like, like a new problem. But this sort of repetitive, either recurring or persisting a symptom, this is, seems to be there. And we're now even seeing statistics to showing the number of, you know, you know, you know, the number of admissions for UTI continuing to go up. You know, NHS Digital shows that. Plus, we're seeing this other entity that, that I mentioned earlier called interstitial cystitis, which is meant to be an A bacterial UTI also going up in terms of the number of things we're seeing, which again sort of fits with this idea that hang on, there's more people getting these symptoms. And what potentially what's happening is that people who've been who are thought to have interstitial cystitis actually what they've got is probably a chronic infection with persisting symptoms and the bacteria just in, and they've been called interstitial cystitis because no one could pick up the bacteria in the urine. But actually, the bacteria in there, you just you just, you know, we just don't have the the the, the, the appropriate test. If you could test the, the tissue in their bladder, probably you would you would be able to find it. But that's a that's more of a kind of a scientific sort of research type test at the moment. It's not something that that you know that you can do on a diagnostic but, uh, way within clinical care.